Yes, so I'm going to hear. I'm here today to talk to you about uh, Diffoscope and uh, how you can, you can just use it as a better diff or uh, for quality assurance, etc., and things like that. Um, little uh, moin. Apparently, that's like a North German thing to say welcome. Apparently, yeah. North German, North Denmark, Scandinavia, that kind of thing. I'm told. People aren't shaking their heads, so I'm going to assume that's true. Yeah, cool. Um, this is my first PC, an IBM 5155. Um, sometimes when you rebooted it, it would launch into, it would somehow revert from booting from the hard disk to um, booting from a basic ROM, as in the programming language ROM that was on our motherboard for some reason. So randomly, you'd just get a chance to program in basic, and then sometimes you wouldn't. I don't know why, but yeah. It's quite fun with this. Uh, kind of clicky keyboard, and that folded in, and it was this kind of big desk thing, anyway. Um, this is my first Debian. At the time, it was already old. Um, what's this one? Is this, is this Slink 2.2? Yeah. And this is when we had like US and non-US, so that's really dating it, if you remember that. Yeah. Um, this is my first contribution to Debian, uh, 19th December 2006, sending a patch to Lily Pond. Um, which is kind of interesting. And um, the response was, oh, yeah, rock on, many thanks. I'll upload this, and it'll be allowed into Etch. And this was, like, super motivating, because Etch was just coming out. Um, and it was like, great, I've got, like, one line of, like, tiny patch in a release. This is, like, super cool. And um, Thomas's like, response was super motivating. So after that, like, that Christmas, I basically spent, like, reading all through the Debian web pages and stuff. Yeah, so it was very well timed. So. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of a good, you know, if someone sends a patch, be like, oh, cool, thanks. Yeah, I like got a little notice in the change log. It was, you know, so stupid, but yeah, so do that kind of thing. Cool, so um, moving on. Um, so why Diffoscope? Why did we write Diffoscope? What's the background here? So it comes from reproducible builds. So a very quick outline of that is that Whilst you can get the source code for free software, you can download the source code for you know, Nginx or whatever, pretty much everyone just down runs binaries on their servers or their systems, you know, apt install, blah, yum install, zip, whatever, um, Android, Play Store, whatever. Um, and can you actually trust whether these two things correspond with each other? Like, you can look at the source code, yeah, it looks all right, and then you install this binary, um, yeah, what happened, who generated that? Um, can you trust that process? Can you trust who generated it? Even if you could trust them, can you trust them not to be exploited, etc.? This is a big problem because you can exploit a build farm and then obviously exploit all of that, you know, add, tro um, add trojans into the build farm so every single binary that comes out is compromised. Kind of problematic. You can also target individual developers' machines. So I could go after, say, your machine and add a little backdoor to it so every a piece of soft, every binary that you give to friends and things like that um, are compromised in some way, steal all your bitcoins or whatever. Um, I can also um, turn up to your door and blackmail you into producing um, uh, software that has compromises or extra features, shall we say, that don't exist in the source code. So what would happen there is that you'd release your source, and the, but the binaries that you produce have this sort of backdoor that's, you know, someone's sort of forcing you into producing. So you don't want to do that. Anyway, enough of that. What you do in, for reproducible builds is you ensure that um, every time you build a piece of software, you get the ident an identical result. Multiple people then compare their builds and check whether they all get the same results. And this means that an attacker must either have infected everyone at the same time or they haven't infected anyone, because that kind of thing. Um, so the, the, the point here is that you have to ensure the builds have identical results. OK, great. Okay. Identical results. OK, great. So um, we you know, start, started you know, reproducible builds projects, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we build two devs. Oh, I'm sorry about the colors there. Um, you probably can't see that. That says SHA-1 sum A deb and B deb. Well, star dot deb, actually. Anyway, we're comparing the SHA-1 sums of two um, binary Debian files. OK, great. So these two files differ. OK, they're not reproducible. Um, why is that? So we'll run a diff on them. Um, yeah. 
So what can we learn from this? Well, not very much. Um, presumably they're compressed, so as soon as we see one change, we'll see it will just cascade changes because that's how compression works. Um, and we, I guess we know it's a deb, f and probably an AR format file with, you know, with a, yeah, yeah, not very useful. Okay, great. So we'll go one level in. We'll um, um, do a binary diff on it. Okay, well, uh, again, that's not really telling us very much with the, um, with the diff there. Yeah. Okay, great. So let's go one level in. ARX, this is on the... Um, um, new maintainer thing, how you unpack a deb. Everyone remembers this, right? All right, All right. Um, you unpack a deb with ARX, and we do that to the b.deb, and then we diff the results of that. Okay, so, um, yeah, 7-zip. Okay, compressed contents, not very useful. Okay, so um, let's unpack the control tar inside, that, um, inside those debs. Okay, and then we run diff on that. Okay, yeah, it's still not really telling us anything useful about how to make this package reproducible. So let's unpack the tar.xz into the tar. Okay, inside that tar, there's a file called md5sums, um, and it, we're starting to see some difference in between um, some files in, this, in these two devs. It's not something meaningful. So now we have like some idea that it's something to do with this user bin pn mixer binary. Okay, interesting, okay. Um, uh, we'll unzip that, and then we'll do a diff on PN Mixer itself. Okay, well now we're back into just binary gobbledygook mode. This isn't very helpful, uh, and this is taking quite a while. And if I remember correctly, Debian has a lot of packages, so this might take a little while. So basically, um, I don't know if you know this particular meme. Um, I should build a better diff, you know, etc. That's not quite true because actually um, it was Luna that started this project, and it was originally called Debbin Diff because we wanted to diff binary Debian packages. So this is the initial commit, 2014. Um, this version is successfully able to report differences in two changes files, not with much interesting details, but it's a start. Uh, yes, and it was a start. Pretty good. So um, fast forwarding. Oh, sorry about these colors. I don't know if we can do anything about the lights. Do that ruin? Yeah? Is that? No? All right, whatever. Um, basically, we're um, diffoscoping on. Um, it r works kind of like diff does normally. You give it two files, and it'll output a sort of unified diff. So, diffoscope A, diff um, B, and one file contains the word foo, one contains the word bar. Brilliant. Nothing actually that out of the ordinary. It's sort of colored by default, so that's why you can't see it, but whatever. Um, um, it, it, it supports archive formats. So if you give it two tar files, um, so if we then tar up um, our A file and our B file into an a.tar and a b.tar, tar, and then run diffoscope on those tar files, we get this kind of like um, hierarchy here. So it's saying that, okay, there are differences between these files. In the file list, um, they have different um, uh, timestamps because I made them at different times. And, um, and here are the contents. So we got foo there and bar there. So we can see the difference between them. Well, I can. I don't know if you can. You get the slides later. Um, if we gzip these tar files and then run diffoscope on those gzip things, it'll say, OK, what we've done is um, we have to unpack it first. And here's the metadata about the, um, the gzip process. And inside that are our a.tar and b.tar from the previous slides and then the A file and the B file. So it's already going two levels deep into this, um, into this tar.gz file. So it's pretty cool. And it's completely recursive. So I think it'll, it'll actually um, blow out after, I think, a thousand. Um, um, we try? No, maybe? Yeah? Well, should I just bump back a bit, just in case? Is that, yeah? Thank you. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, yeah, foobar and foobar. So that's the AB file. We've tarred them up. And so now you see the hierarchy are foo and bar file there. And then we've gzip them. So there's the gzip uh, layer, there's the tar layer, and then there's the files themselves. Kind of cool. And this is our, on a real deb from the archive. Um, 
inside this dev there's a data.tar.xz and in that xz file there's obviously a data.tar and inside that tar file there's a file called AFF and inside that there's a version string that's different and that looks like a build date so we probably know that if we went back to the source package we could very quickly work out you know with a very quick grep work out where this file is being um, generated from the d.d .d AFF file and then just it'll be probably be usually quite obvious that it's using the current build time and then we can just you know, patch that and be like fix it etc so great so this has gone from a two rather obscure binary debs all the way to the fix probably in about you know five five minutes you know and you could probably send a patch off in that time because it'll be quite quick and without without diffoscope here without this sort of recursive unpacking um you'd be just completely lost you'd be there with r or a ARX all day and working out which files are different and trying to use XXD and all this kind of nonsense. Um, Diffoscope's got some other things as well. So if you're trying to do reproducible packages and things are varying just on the line ordering, um, we detect whether um, a file differs only in the line ordering. So um, here's file A. These lines are in order. File B has these order are in lines. That's very difficult to say, actually. It's like all those tongue twisters. Run Diffoscope on those two, and it says it's got ordering differences only. That's interesting. So it probably needs a sort. You can go all the way back to the source code, work out very, very quickly. If you, kn if you know it's just ordering differences, you just kind of know, and you know what the inputs are going to be. You kind of search for order and R, and you get the right files. Ah, you just have a sort in the right place. Bam, send the patch off. Everything's great. Oh, and send it upstream as well, because you're good. Um, it supports a lot more things. So um, that we've been showing the terminal text output here. Um, moving on. It's got a HTML output mode, which is really useful in the um, um, hierarchical thing when it gets a bit more complicated. So um, the diff, instead of being layered on top of each other like a unified diff, you get the, um, the diff on the left and the right, and you get sort of a nested um, thing inside with colors and, and lines and you can link to various things and it includes bits of metadata here and other bits here and what command it used. So that's the HTML output. We also support a lot of file formats. So it's not just on text. Um, it supports all of these. So to very quickly run through some of them. So you can give it to Android APK files, which are kind of like zips but magic. Um, and it'll, it'll know how to um, compare them. So there's like a manifest file that needs decoding. It supports Berkeley DB databases, um, Word documents. So that's a Word document with A, and that's a Word document with B, and it'll correctly do that. If you ran that through diff normally, that would obviously be a binary mess, so completely useless. Um, um, Ebooks, like uh, there's an EPUB, it also supports Mobby. So if you give it to um, EPUB files, it'll say, oh, they just differ in this state. Brilliant. Um, and normally that would be completely useless diff, binary diff again. So you can be like, oh, EPUB date one, okay, grep the source code for that, bam, make a patch very quickly. Uh, mono binaries, um, Git repositories, yeah, why not? Um, numeric spreadsheets, um, ISO images. Oh, yeah, ISO images are really cool. So if, um, it'll basically unpack the ISO. Then inside that, there might be, like, say, a squash FS image. And then it'll just com completely go down into that and work out um, any differences between the two um, contents in the ISO file, including any metadata. So this is on the squash FS metadata headers, I think. But say inside that ISO, there was a file that was a, a, a you know, there was a PDF, and inside that PDF was a, a, a ping file which varied. It would basically go all the way down and say, yeah, yeah, it's actually here in this ping that the data differs. And that means that you can just go, again, all go all the way back to the source and say, okay, cool, we know how to fix this quite quickly. And this is really valuable in getting the recent tails distribution uh, reproducible. So their um, ISOs are reproducible. So you, if you build one and I build one, we get the exact same one. And that's kind of useful for something like Tails, where you would probably want to, of all, there are a lot of projects you might want to compromise. You, you might want to go after that one, because the kind of people who are using it, you know, whatever. 
Um, we support comparing images. So this is using, um, um, I think it's using as SNG to text. So, and then just running that through diff. Um, and that is a Linux penguin, and that is something else. I can't remember now. Oh, FT or something. Anyway, it supports images. Um, it supports JSON, and it will um, pretty print. So if you give it two uh, JSON files, one with key value after, blah, 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 it'll do a nice diff of them. Um, it will first um, pretty print it first before doing the diff, so it'll actually give you something clean. Otherwise, I don't know if you've ever diffed two very long JSON lines. If they differ in the middle, you just get a huge, long, unified diff. But here it's like, oh, just those two things that have changed. Cool. Brilliant. Um, open document text formats. Um, OG audio files, because why not? Um, TC dump capture files, that's actually quite useful. Uh, PDFs, so uh, that PDF says hello world, and this PDF says hello sick sad world. I don't know why that particular text in the demo, but yeah. Um, so yeah, again, run that through normal diff program, garbage. XML documents, um, again, it'll pretty print them, so it's nice, actually nice to read. So, I mean, if you want to get started on Diffiscope, the um, e very easiest and quickest way to do is fire up your web browser, try.diffiscope.org, select two files, press compare, it'll, and it'll upload them and run um, a run Diffiscope in with all of the support for all of the file formats in the cloud for you and give you a nice HTML page that you can then link to people. So that's that's the very quickest way to get started. The next quickest way is to install Try Diffiscope. And then you can just run that on two files. And it'll basically do the same thing. It'll run it in the same cloud service as Try Diffiscope, but either give you the um, result on the command line, or it'll, if you pass the web browser option, it will give you an URL or load your web browser. I can't remember exactly which, um, with the same results. So you don't have to install any. This is you know one kilobyte of Python. You know, it's got nothing, basically. Um, so yeah, that's the, um, the next quickest way. Um, but you can then install Diffiscope itself on your own machine. Uh, I recommend not installing recommends because um, all of those file formats might drag in extra um, things. So that'll be all of tech, um, I think all of OpenOffice, all of uh, Mono, all of Java, all of, yeah. Um, so, yeah, Android, yeah, Android yeah, is quite big, yeah, that's one. Um, bunch of interest. I think there's another big one I can't think of. Yeah, so they're all optional, and it'll say, um, oh, by the way, I support um, tech documents or whatever, mono, or whatever, but um, uh, you need to install this package, and then you get like full uh, pretty printed support. Um, and it'll tell you that when it's missing. So if you just start with install recommends, uh, disabled, uh, run it on your file. If it says, please install this package, you can then install them as you go along, as you want, rather than you know installing everything. And then you just pass it two files, and it works as before. Cool. So um, how you can improve your own quality assurance and Debian packaging with Diffiscope? Um, the biggest, uh, biggest value here is not necessarily for reproducible builds. It's for basically just seeing where you do want to have a diff, and you're expecting a diff, and you're expecting a particular type of diff and in a particular way. You can basically see those changes. Um, and if you built two Debs normally, and then just ran, uh, you know, uh, well, I'll, go th I'll try a demo in a second, but if you build a, um, a Deb with a patch applied and then built a Deb with a patch applied, you can obviously run um, a diff on the source package, uh, but that's not very useful because, you know, it's the binaries that are going to end up on people's machines. But if you run a diff on the binary itself, you're like, did, the, did my changes actually hit the binary? I don't really know. So yeah, um, so I'll just I'll just run through a very um, live demo, of course. So it's going to fail. Um, so switch to a. Is that big enough for everyone? Yeah. Um, let's find some. Well, yeah. 
I'm, 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 a, I'm a DD, I promise. So we'll check out some, um, we'll get this libnetx Java, and um, we'll just build that once. OK. So let's say we are um, on the security team, and we want to apply a patch. And we want to like just be really sure, because we're going to push it out to all our users. So um, first, we will make a change log. Um, Closing a bug. Whatever. Cool. And then we'll um, find some find some Java file to change. Let's pretend we have a real patch. Um, let's pretend that the security floor is right. Okay. Let's. Replace that equals equals, like say that was the fix. I make it up, probably isn't, might break. But okay, say that's the patch from upstream, upstream blessed patch. Yes, yes, yeah, probably. Okay, so when we build this, what we want to see is just that change in the file. We don't want to see any other nonsense changes we've accidentally done. But we also definitely want to see that change because if our binary of our security release doesn't have that change, then we aren't actually fixing people's machines. We'll issue a DSA. Everyone will install it and be like, oh, it's nice and secure, but actually you want. I mean, yeah, you should do proper testing as well, but hey, we'll multiple levels, right? Cool. Um, so we'll build that again. Ah, there's no test suite, so that's good. All right. Um, and then we will. Um, let's save that directory. Oh, I don't want to do that. So, right. Um, let's. Oh, then we want to do output HTML. So we want to diff the original one, zero five. Oh, you probably can't see that. We want to diff that one with our fake security one there right so you can see um, a nice little progress bar 100 percent one there are differences okay there should be some differences so let's see what those differences are in our web browser using the nice HTML output is that big enough for everyone yeah okay um, so let's have a look um, are we seeing what we want to see? So, uh, okay, there's some changes in the con in the data tar. Okay, we kind of expect that. Um, what's changed in our control file? Okay, well the version's changed. Well, we wanted that to change. Perfect, and it's changed to nine year one. Okay, cool. That's what we want to see. No other changes here. So there was no weird control dot in magic going on. Cool. Um, Right, in our data tar, um, oh, we've got a lot of timestamp changes. Well, okay, we'll ignore those for now. Um, the change log has changed. Well, I hope so, because I added a change log entry. There's my CV number. Right, here's what we want to start seeing. We want to see a change in the, the jar file, which is the, the, um, the Java class, Java compiled um, sort of archive format. Uh, okay, we're seeing some uh, meaningless timestamp changes, but we can kind of ignore those. Let's pretend, because that's just metadata, maybe. Okay, parser.class. Okay, so if you can see here, it's basically done a decompilation of the Java file itself, and is basically saying that, oh, it used to say if null, and if not null. So these are the actual byte Java bytecode instructions. And what's really useful here is that no other, nothing else has changed. We just expected that change between the two opcodes of if null to if not non null, which is good because like it hasn't made any other code changes. But also crucially, we can see that it has actually made a change to the code. Um, 
for example, it wasn't going to use some cached version or something like that. So this is really useful. And just running a, a, a naive diff wouldn't have given that, of course, because it would have just come up with binary garbage. And just seeing that the dev had changed, again, wouldn't have actually told you anything because all of the change logger would have changed as well. So it's like, well, yes, it's different. But the meaningful change there, the actual fixes the floor, would have still been present. But we know it's there. Um, yeah. So that's, that's kind of cool. You can be like, yeah, you, so shipping this dev out, I'd be quite confident that that, assuming that was the actual bug, assuming I'd be quite confident in pushing that out because it's very minimal amount of changes. You, know, you want to do that with security releases, et cetera. So yeah, that's um, sort of a live demo. Cool. Uh, the other one is seeing no changes at all. So if you, um, you could build once, if you build is reproducible, um, you could build once, change your compiler or change some other part of your tool chain, um, build it again, and if you get the exact same results, uh, well, great, that's not, that's what you intended. You want to see no changes when you change some part of it, um, as, as, assuming you want to you do that. And that's really useful. Um, if there were changes, Diffiscope would highlight them and show you exactly why they had changed. It might be some compiler optimizations, might be some other thing as well. Um, so you can use it in both ways, when you expect changes and when you don't expect changes. And if those don't match your expectation, Diffiscope will tell you exactly why. Um, it's also useful when other companies um, are doing security releases. So um, naming no names whatsoever. But they like to um, release patches as you know, just a new firmware for your router in big, you know, fairly large sort of file system images. You basically have no idea what's changed between these two files. Um, again, if you ran them through a diff, completely useless. You could start to unpack them with um, SquatchFS and blah, blah, blah. But yeah, they're probably sort of concatenated CPIO archives, you know, so there's nonsense. But Diffiscope will just chew through those and give you actually what the difference is between these two files. And so you're like, OK, cool, they've, they've changed this. They've removed or added some GPL license code or something. Yeah, that'd be quite interesting. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, for example. Um, yeah, so it's very useful for, for diffing those kind of um, binary blobs that come from um, various people. So yeah, the, what's the current state of the Diffiscope? So um, the development is an up and down. Um, I did a, uh, yeah. So again, it started around, what was it, May 2014, something like that. Um, a bunch of work here. That's probably, that is Heidelberg, I think. No, 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 15. These are probably just dev comps, basically. Yeah. Um, yes. Although, who was hacking on Cape Town? Mm. Maybe these uh, dates are... Anyway, yeah. Don't know it's up and down. It's kind of interesting. Um, it's used a lot in the reproducible builds project, of course. So every time we do a, um, a build on the tests.reproduciblebuilds.org fr um, testing framework, if we run Diffiscope on the result, if, if it's reproducible, it just says, hey, the files are the same. Cool. Um, but if not, um, we publish the Diffiscopes of all your packages that are unreproducible. So you can just go on there and be like, what's the difference between these two things? Um, I don't know the differences here. I think it's some ordering. Whatever, doesn't matter. Um, cool. Um, I also did a lot of work optimizing um, Diffiscope. It had some rather perverse, um, I think, n, n squared loops inside it. Um, so uh, managed to cut down some of the time here, cut down down here, down here. Um, so yeah, so there's been quite a few performance enhancements in the over, in, over the past. Um, uh, these are the Git tags. So this is version 80, I think, and this is version 50. And I just ran the same op a benchmark across them all. Um, so this shows when I've introduced some rather, op uh, rather well, I'm going to say rather clever optimizations. It's more like removing rather stupid code. It was uh, embarrassing, but whatever. Speeds up now. Um, there's work being done right now on parallel processing. There's been quite a few attempts at it before, but adding it is kind of interesting um, um, and difficult. Luckily, we have an um, outreachy student, Juliana. Is she in the room? Is she hiding? 
she's here and she will be talking tomorrow about her work on parallel processing in Diffiscope. And that'd be amazing because um, a lot of it's sort of IO bound or waiting for external processes and with multiple CPU machines, you might as well just be like, well, whilst I'm waiting for the result for a PDF to be unpacked, I might as well be running something over on another CPU. So I think we're going to see some real performance wins once we do get parallel processing merged and working and such and stuff like that. Um, you can check out our website, diffiscope.org, recently migrated to um, Salsa. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, and everything in the, everything in the root ROM reproduced world is now on Salsa, which is kind of cool. Um, that's quite recent, you know, cutting it a bit fine. But, you know, um, so yeah, um, thank you very much. Thank you, Shun. If you've got any questions about Tiffiscope, just launch them out. Oh, we've got one over here. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, buzzword question. Can it diff uh, container image formats? Uh, depends which ones. So if they are just um, directory fa directories, then yes, because it's just a directory. Do you have ones particularly in mind, like Docker? Or yeah, f the obvious one yeah, is Docker, and then there's this OCI, I believe, is the standard one. Oh, and yeah. that could make it buzzword compliant. Oh, okay, well, we're all about buzzwords, right? Yeah. I mean, it could probably differ scope blockchains as and well. And then run your diffoscope on Kubernetes and see the difference between updates of your container images. Bam, sold. Where do I invest? Um, so I wasn't aware that o OCI, o is that what it's called? OCI, I believe. OCI. Um, so no, it doesn't, basically doesn't support that right now. Um, but it wouldn't be too difficult. Presumably there are tools to unpack it. And as soon as we have a tool to unpack it, it can then just go in, into that. There is a open wish list bug for Docker um, containers, and it f to the point where uh, I think it'd be really nice if you could just give it, say, two image names or whatever the noun is. So you can say, "Oh yeah, please diff these two Docker images that are available," and it could look at your local thing and do a diff on them. Um, but currently, it's not supported. But there is an open wish list bug. Yeah. Shouldn't any company that releases binaries be interested? in supporting Diffoscope and using it? Uh, the resp uh, just for the microphone. Well, take the microphone. Bas basically, when company releases binary, they are not interested in users seeing differences. So. No, no, for the internal ah. UA. Yes. Um, then, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised that um, actually that the, the Docker bug was only opened two months ago. So I'm actually surprised that there hasn't been more interest in diffing container images. But if you would like to open one for OCI, that would be really appreciated. And um, we can get onto that. Um, that'd be great. Looking at the page for OCI, uh, it says that it's uh, based on Docker, basically. So once I think you get oh. OCI for free once you've sorted out Docker. Nice, good. <laughs> if cool. you're lucky. Oh, okay. The OCI image format is they wrote down how Docker image. Oh, okay. Work. So this image. Okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll sort that out and. Um, yeah, and it seems like we're using a Docker a little bit more in Debian, so this is probably quite interesting, yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, out of curiosity, um, which algorithm are you using inside? Uh, are you using some bioinformatics uh, algorithm to diff trees efficiently? Um, no, um, it's really naive. Okay. Um, it just just does a. It basically is um, all it does is um, run the normal diff, the normal diff tool, but it will um, 
do a, you'll try and identify files and unpack them first, if you see what I mean. So it will use the um, file utility, if you know what I mean, the file uh, identifier thing that says, oh, this is a PDF, and goes, ah, okay, well, you're a PDF, so we'll try and unpack it first. Yeah, so it doesn't do any clever uh, matching. The only, the clever matching it does do is there's some fuzzy matching as well. So if you just rename a directory between two inside a container, it'll say, yeah, there's a massive fuzzy match between these, between these two files, things like that. Yeah, so that's, that's kind of useful. But apart from that, it's not, it's not that clever, which is kind of, I think, what you want. Because if it was too clever, it would start to be a little bit opaque. You'd start to be like, well, yeah. I mean, I personally like quite dumb tools. You know, yeah, see what I mean, yeah. So I mean, one question to you would be whether we should start, to, you know how um, if you want to do a, um, a release to um, stable or something like that, um, you get asked for the, um, the deb diff. So I'm wondering if anyone, I mean, I've also, when doing that myself, I've been submitting uh, diffoscope outputs as well, because they're just slightly more readable and useful. So I'm not sure if anyone would have any objection to people asking for those. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of just running on the sort, yeah, we have a, at least one thumbs up. So yeah, I mean, I'll I'll propose that to the release team. See what they say. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Anyway, thank you very much. If there any other questions? No further questions. Then let's thank Chris again. Thank you very much.